So uh, I wasn't really sure what exactly to talk about with respect to Orlani, new Orlani coagulants, but I guess what the main focus will be on that I think that the concerns about bleeding are perhaps um, exaggerated. So hopefully I can convince you of that by the end of my talk. <clears throat> Uh, there's my disclosures. I've done some stuff with all the companies that make um, these products. So just first by way of summary, you all know there are three main products now. Adoxaban is coming on the market, but I don't think we have it yet in Canada. And we have some significant differences between the three drugs. So the bigger trend, of course, is a direct 2A inhibitor, Mivaroxaban, Apixaban, 10A inhibitors. The Bigatran has two different doses of 150 BID and 100 BID, <clears throat> 110 BID, which is adjusted for those who have high risk factors or old age. Um, in atrial fib, at least, rivaroxaban has been used in a slightly lower dose for those who have some renal dysfunction. And similarly for apixaban, the usual dose is 5 BID, but you can use the lower dose of 2.5 BID if you meet two out of the three following criteria on that slide. There are some differences in half-life, but um, uh, generally, the half-lives are reasonably short, um, but due to the renal excretion factor, we try to avoid dibigatran when there's any concern about renal function. Um, rivaroxaban and apixaban probably have a, a more of a, a safer profile, and monitoring is not required. So this is just a slide to show that there's, um, uh, this is after patients have received a week of, uh, of rivaroxaban and that you do get some um, uh, obvious changes in 10A according to the different doses. Um, but after uh, basically a 24-hour period, if this is your last dose, you're getting down close to no anticoagulant effect after a 24-hour period. And after a two-day period, you basically are down to no drug effect whatsoever. And that's really didn't, independent of the dose that's been used in these studies. So now what are we currently doing to manage bleeding? So, well, we can use um, PCC, and this is a study that was in volunteers, and it showed in this top one here that if you, um, this is the placebo on top, and if you get your um, uh, river boxaban, and then you take your PCC. Um, uh, with placebo PCC, uh, you don't have any, your, your prothrombin does not come down, but with um, real PCC, your prothrombin comes down nicely. And the bottom diagram is to show that your endogenous thrombin potential returns quickly up to normal when you get PCC, whereas it takes a long time for that to happen with placebo. So it appears as though a three-factor PCC is effective, at least in volunteers. <clears throat> So we used that originally in our protocols, but we now are using uh, FIBA if necessary. So this is the protocol that we expect people to follow at the Ottawa Hospital. Um, it's really, most of this is intuitive. And um, obviously you stop your drug, um, you identify the source of bleeding, you apply local or surgical measures to gain source control, uh, supportive measures, confirm timing. With the Bigotran, at least there's some suggestion you could use activated charcoal, but I would suggest that's rarely used and probably not necessary. Um, you can measure your uh, coagulation parameters. They don't tell you a lot unless they're normal, so I'm not really sure I recommend that. Um, but we do that as part of our protocol for now as we gather data over time. Um, by measuring the creatinine clearance, you might have some idea about when the drug should be gone from the system. And I showed you those curves on, those, on that earlier slide, which would give you some idea about when the drug is largely gone. You, consider, you could consider use of IV tranexamic acid. Um, Again, no trial data to tell us if that really works, but it's not an unreasonable thing to try if the bleeding is not controlled. Now, if the bleeding continues or is life-threatening, including, of course, intracranial hemorrhage, then what we recommend is that you use FIBA. <clears throat> you should follow your uh, coagulation parameters to see if, at least in the laboratory, there's evidence that you've corrected the, the coagulation effect, <clears throat> but, of course, that your main measure is going to be clinical. But really, let's look at some of the outcomes and see whether all this worry about bleeding is necessary. First of all, I'd like to argue that it is the, um, these drugs are the safer drugs. So this is pooled data from the SPAF trials, and here's the efficacy. The efficacy is, this side is in favor of warfarin, this side favors the uh, NOAX or DOAX or whatever you want to call them. But you can see for efficacy, it's pretty close to the same for ischemic stroke, much better for hemorrhagic stroke. For MI, it's pretty much the same. Um, All-cause mortality, interestingly, is significantly less with the use of these drugs. Uh, intracranial hemorrhage in all studies and in pooled data shows that there is probably its 50% risk reduction with the use of these products. And gastrointestinal bleeding was slightly higher um, in these studies um, when you pool the data. But what about fatal bleeding events? Is that really the bottom line? And Kathy, I started late, by the way, so um, I've only been talking for three minutes. 
Uh, what about fatal bleeding? Because maybe this is really the, um, the real factor as to what, what is the risk of death. So what I argue is that these products are safer. So even in these trials, which were double blind in some cases, some cases they were single, uh, they, were, they weren't blind, they were open trials. But regardless, when people first started using these drugs in these trials, they had no idea what to do. So they didn't even have our simple protocol using FIBA. And yet in all these studies, when you pool the data, and in fact individually in almost all the studies, the risk of fatal bleeding is less with these products. So if reversing warfarin is so important, why is there less fatal bleeding when you use these drugs? You have to understand that with warfarin, there's never been a randomized trial to see if reversing warfarin makes any difference. It's just because we could, we did. But we don't actually know it makes any difference. And these studies would suggest that it probably doesn't make any difference, or at least it doesn't make a difference that we don't have fancy reversing agents for these products. So this is the overall fatal bleeding rate when you compare the atrial, when you pool the atrial fib and VTE phase three trials. And you can see that the risk of fatal bleeding, the risk ratio is 0.53 with a pretty narrow confidence interval. So really I think the risk of fatal bleeding is significantly less, at least in these clinical trials, when you use uh, the new, or new oral anticoagulants or direct oral anticoagulants. So to me, it's the safer product. I've always had, a, it's been a similar, you always want to use the safest drug first. You have to not rely on your own, on your own um, internal worries that may not be justified on the basis of any data. So it's the same thing with um, IV unfractionated heparin. People like to use that drug when they think people are at higher risk of bleeding because they think they can reverse it with protamine and you can turn it off. But the reality is when you look at trials, there's half the risk of, or, or, or there's about, a, uh, not half the risk, but there's about the risk of major hemorrhage on low molecular weight heparin is significantly less than it is with low molecular weight fractionated heparin. So low molecular heparin is a safer product than unfractionated heparin. So when you're worried about people bleeding, why are you using unfractionated heparin? Doesn't make any sense. And actually, the low, same with low molecular weight heparin. If you're using it Q12, it's out of your system after about six hours after you inject it. So by the time you figure out the patient's bleeding, the chances are there's almost no drug left anyway. So I think the, the worry about bleeding is considerably overhyped with these products. And of course, people are going to bleed. And when we see them in the emergency now, we're all going to flip out. Um, but the data shows that they're probably safer products. So stroke and systemic emboli, again, as I showed uh, earlier, if you pull the uh, pool studies that um, the Rely, Rocket, Aristotle, and Engage, which used the doxaban, again, you can see that there's less uh, stroke or, sy or systemic embolic events. But to me, it's, it's more the bleeding factor, which is the really, which is the really strong um, factor in favor of these drugs. <clears throat> And indeed, though, there are other outcomes in the phase three trials that may be of relevance or importance to you. So all-cause mortality, the absolute risk reduction was 0.76%. Number needed to treat 132. Vascular mortality, absolute risk reduction, 5.3. Bleeding mortality, 0.3. And intracranial bleeding, 0.85. So absolute risk reduction is close, half to 1%. Yes, the number needed to treat is quite a lot, but I think that's, at this point, at least from a pure data and safety point of view, I think these drugs show that they're safer than, than warfarin. <clears throat> so this is the efficacy and safety of just 10 A inhibitors in phase three VTE trials. And you see the same sort of thing. It's not the recurrent VTE that's so impressive. So maybe slightly less recurrent VTE, um, not statistically significant in this meta-analysis, but major bleeding significantly less, intracranial bleeding significantly less, fatal bleeding significantly less, all cause mortality the same. So I, I, from a bleeding point of view, I think that they're, they're pretty reasonable products. <clears throat> anyway, so what are we doing right now for perioperative management? We get a million consults for this a week. Um, it's absolutely driving me crazy because they're boring and anybody should be able to do this. This is just not rocket science. Um, but anyway, this is the algorithm that we are currently using. So for the 10A inhibitors, if you have low bleeding risk procedure, then we stop one day before. So that means you're gonna miss technically you're, you're going to miss um, the dose the morning of, that doesn't count, you're also you're going to miss the day before. So you, you have a reasonable length of time by missing two doses if you're low bleeding risk. And as I showed you on another graph, the anticoagulant left in the blood at that point in time is not that high. In fact, it's close to zero. Uh, if you're high bleeding risk, okay, we all want to be a little more cautious, we stop two days before. The bigotran is a little bit more complicated because of the renal issue. Um, and, and frankly, the bigotran is just a bit more of a nuisance overall, I think, as a drug, and I, I never prescribe it personally. Um, the BID thing is a, is a pain for patients. You have a Pixaban that has a BID profile, and it has a better, pro, it has a better safety profile than the bigotran. Uh, 
But anyway, if your patients are on dabigatran, they're low risk for bleeding. If their creatinine, creatinine clearance is reasonable, you can stop one day before, just like over here. But if it's less than 50, we're recommending two days before and a similar protocol if you're high risk for bleeding. Some people like to say if you're high risk for bleeding, this should be two days and this should be four days. Um, unclear right now. This is a protocol that we're following and we're collecting data. So we'll see how well this works out. Um, so, and what is there, there was some perioperative data from the trials and over 7,000 patients coming off rivaroxaban in the rocket AFib study, there are only two thromboembolic events. Um, so the strategy that they used was the one I described just on that previous slide and they, patients did well. 30-day um, events um, were basically the same. So uh, that sort of a protocol, at least in the trials, seemed to be pretty good. I can't see how we're going to find different data. I'm sure we'll just confirm that that's a safe way to manage these products. <clears throat> um, so if it's around urgent surgery, of course, it's a little more of a problem. If it's a P2 surgery within 24 to 48 hours, and I think you know, we already have the strategy for if, it's, if you have a 24 to 48 hour period. And if the PT has become normal, or if you're more concerned, you can measure the anti-10A level. Although I fear that the anti-10A level is going to be like it is with low molecular heparin, that people think it means something. We don't really know what it means. Um, but if it makes you feel more comfortable, there is data with low molecular heparin and unfractionated heparin that if you have a low anti-10A level, less than 0.2 or less, then the patient, uh, patient's risk of bleeding should be very low. But of course, if you have an urgent surgery, then you're kind of stuck. You've got to use FIBA. And the truth is we don't have a lot of data yet as to how patients are going to do when we use FIBA in that situation. Um, but as I mentioned, we are collecting that information. So effective the Bigatran, again, it's just more of a, more of a complicated drug. The thrombin time is, is very sensitive. You can have a sniff of the Bigatran in your system and your thrombin time is prolonged. Um, so it's not all that great. The PTT and INR is not sensitive enough, and the APTT has a curvilinear response, so that's not useful either. It's probably a dilute thrombin time, which is the best test. But again, we really aren't at a stage now where we can know exactly how to correlate that with clinical management, unfortunately. So what about after surgery? Uh, when do you restart anticoagulants? Well, we all know that the DOAX have been used in uh, prophylaxis trials, so they're safe post-op in prophylactic doses. So anyway, our strategy is that the DOAC can be resumed the same evening if it's been a minimum of six hours post-op, just like in the trials, but we use a prophylactic dose for that first dose. And then if it's a low or standard bleeding risk procedure, then we go back to their maintenance dose uh, the next day. If it's a higher risk surgery, so you've had a TERP or vascular surgery, neurosurgery, then we just use prof doses for three days before we start the, uh, the, the, ma the usual maintenance dose. And of course, if there's incomplete hemostasis, um, we don't use the uh, DOAC until we're sure that the bleeding has stopped. And if there's bowel paralysis, we also don't use these drugs because we're not sure how much they're being absorbed if people don't have, um, haven't had proper return of bowel function. So there's some cool stuff coming out. Um, most of you are probably aware of this. It's a recombinant engineered version of human factor 10A. So basically, since it's a, uh, um, an inactive engineered 10A, it competes for the 10A inhibitors. So some goes on your real 10A and some goes on your anti on this um, on this product, and that's the way it's neutralized. Um, <clears throat> and some details on what they've done to the product, but nobody really cares, so I'll just skip that. <clears throat> um, and what's really cool, it's it's an IV infusion, and you can see here that um, when you infuse the dose, the anti 10A activity comes crashing down basically immediately when you use the product, but it does come back up. And depending on the dose, that can come back up within an hour or two. So studies are being done right now to look at what's the right way to do that drug in an, on, a, on an infusion basis rather than a bolus basis. And I know there's, uh, I think they're already into uh, phase two trials. Uh, I'm not, I don't, we haven't signed up for anything like that yet. But so this product is moving along. It obviously works, um, but it's going to need some time to understand exactly how to use it in care and, and how to use an infusion of it. And then when you turn it off, the, uh, the drug returns. So you're going to have to get through that sort of half-life time that I showed you on the other slide before you'd be able to completely stop the infusion if you're still worried about bleeding. <clears throat> so some fun stuff coming along with that, but um, really that's uh, all I wanted to emphasize today was the bleeding issue, and if there's any particular questions, I'm happy to take them. <clears throat>